Okay, now welcome everyone and good afternoon to the, um, welcome to the Sadafa General Membership Meeting for fall 2020. Um, we have a rather tight schedule because we have a lot of great information. So we're going to follow the program very closely and start with introducing uh, the Sadafa board, which was um, just completed after our recent elections. I am David Milroy. I'm the chair of Sadafa, currently retired and forever retired. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce Carol Whaley. Hi, uh, I'm Carol Whaley. Uh, apologize for not being live on camera, but uh, I'm not camera ready. Uh, <laughs> I uh, am newly elected as the vice chair uh, of Sadafa. And I, uh, well, I, I'm currently not teaching because uh, I got all my classes cut, but normally I am uh, adjunct at City College in the drama department. Very good. Carlin? My name is Carlin Alvey. I've been teaching at Mesa since 82, uh, but like many of the other adjuncts, I have no classes this year. And um, I'm glad you guys have Zoom. I'm still learning it because I don't <laughs> teach. I don't have that much way to practice. Okay. So, oh, and I have an unstable internet connection, so you don't get to see me live, sorry. There you go. Thank you, Carlin. Arnie. Hi, I'm Arnie Schoenberg. I teach at City College, been uh, there for about 20 something years, um, teaching anthropology. I'm the secretary of Sadafa, but David's been doing most of the work these days. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. And I also um, am sometime rep at from City College, City College rep. Okay, thank you. And Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Wilson. I teach at Palomar. I am now the represent representative for Palomar. Um, I am a new member of Sadafa, and um, I have joined because I thought it is important to have somebody that is not completely associated with just your college that adjuncts need to talk across the board. Thank you, Helen. Lenore. Hi, I'm Lenore McCrory. I have been teaching at Miramar College for about five years. Um, I have uh, three English classes. Uh, usually, well, they can be English 49 or they were 49, uh, 101 and 205. And um, so I am I'm very happy to be here. I have, like I said, I've been teaching for five years and uh, I am one of the very fortunate individuals to have a very supportive chair uh, that actually protects me uh, from occasions where a student has, I, I was accused last semester of uh, what was it? Um, oh, when you when you chase someone and you uh, accosting, I forget the word for it. But uh, uh, she <laughs> she immediately took the position that there must be some mental health issue here with a student, yeah. not with me. Although okay. uh, your internet is mentally, I mean, um, unstable, Carleen. My mind is mentally right now unstable. But <laughs> let's not We're all about. there. Thank you, Lenore. <laughs> I'm not sure is Scott here. Scott was going to be calling in if he could. I, I call him. See, I don't see Scott. Okay. Don't see Scott either. Okay, he so that's our current board. We do, however, have some uh, campus rep positions which are available if anyone is teaching at um, these colleges. We have a position for Southwestern College, Grossmont College, Quimaca College, San Diego Continuing Ed, and Imperial Valley College are all open. And uh, if you'd like to submit your name, you can be appointed by the board before the next elections uh, or immediately. So that would be wonderful to have representatives from those colleges. One thing I would like to point out recently, we decided uh, changed our bylaws to for the membership dues for Sadafa will be free until June 2021 in the end of this fis this academic year. Uh, we figured since the food costs for doing a Zoom meeting are pretty low. Um, <laughs> we will just give everyone a break and say, hey, let's all hang in there together. And so uh, your dues are free. We do ask that you sign up and register, but the dues are free until June 21st of next year, which is good news. We'd also would like to invite you to go to our website at sadafa.org and to our Facebook site, which is San Diego Adjunct Faculty Association, Sadafa. And there's a lot of great information in those places and ways of communicating on a daily basis. We'd now like to have our, our uh, 
attendees introduce themselves and quickly, since we have a lot, uh, about 10, 15 seconds per person, if you could just tell us your name, your current colleges or college and the subject you teach and how many years you've been teaching, 20 years, 15 years. So I think we'll start with, um, I think everyone's looking at the same screen. So we'll start with Deborah. You mean me? Yes. Oh, okay. It's your 10 seconds of fame. Go. Oh, my, my 10 seconds of fame. Okay. Well, of course, I'm retired, but I taught part time for the Contra Costa Community College District for over 30 years. And I retired in 2016. I taught um, music and humanities. Um, worked on for 16 years on my union board and was eight years on our faculty senate board. And let's see, I'm enjoying retirement. Very good. Thank you, Deborah. Laura. Uh, Laura Collins. I teach at Mesa College. I've been there for 29 years. Uh, most of it is adjunct. Then I was contract and earned tenure. And then I resigned that and went back to adjunct. <laughs> and um, um, I've been well supported by, uh, you know, my department and uh, the dean and so forth. And so um, I'm here actually for selfish reasons because I want to hear about retirement. Um, I decided okay. to not accept a spring assignment. And so I'm kind of looking at where I'm going to go from here. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. Now mm -hmm. down to Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Byrne. I'm a full-time CPA and I also teach at Palomar and Maricosta. And uh, see, I started teaching in 2014 at Delta College and I've been at Palomar since 2017 and Maricosta since last year. All right, Th thank you, Stacy. Alexis. Um, I was surprised because I'm a guest here. I'm uh, not a special from San guest. Diego. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm from Pasadena and um, uh, know some colleagues here from uh, statewide work, but uh, I'm re currently retiring from Pasadena. It, it is a process um, to go through, but I just heard from payroll okay. at Pasadena just this morning that okay. uh, it was actually going to go through and um, I, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, name college and how many years you teach have been teaching? Sabine. Yeah, and my name is Avina Kutscherm and obviously I teach for 15 years at San Diego City College in the biology department. How was that? Very good, thank you. Sharon. <clears throat> um, my name is uh, yeah Sharon and um, I've been teaching for this district for 15 years, community um, continuing ed and out of West, West City exercise classes. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Well, welcome Sharon, thank you. Rusty. Hello, my name is Rusty. Um, I teach political science at Mesa College, and I've been teaching since 2007. Albert Cruz. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Cruz. I teach uh, information system at uh, Mesa College since uh, 20, uh, 2013, seven years now. Great. Thank you, Albert. Sharon Gregory. Y you got Sharon already. How about Leticia? Oh. Leticia. I'm, I don't know why I can forget to unmute. Hi, I'm uh, from Imperial Valley College. I teach ESL. Oh, thank you, Leticia. P people are jumping, so I, I, I have a hard time finding where they are. Uh, Christine? Hi there, I'm Christine. I uh, work at City College uh, since 2007 in LA County for additional seven years, uh, photography department. Okay, thank you. Marianne? Yes, hi, my name is Marianne Gibson and I teach web development at Mesa College. I've been there since 2012. Oh, great, 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 thank you. Moving on, Farrell Foreman. Hi, I've been teaching at San Diego City for 20 years, English. Glad to be here. Great, thank you, Farrell. Jane Brayman. Hi, I've been teaching at Miracosta since 2015 at Palomar before that. I'm also part-time at Cal State San Marcos. Great, Indiana. thank you, Jane. Anna? Yes, yeah, I'm a part-time librarian at Mesa. I began in uh, 1990. 
but very part time. Okay. Um, well, we're, our schedule begins again at 220, which is about seven minutes. Um, were there any uh, questions that you wanted to throw out? And we can think about them as the day goes by and talk about them later. My main question revolves around um, the fact that I do put into my own solo IRA through my business. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm putting into a step. And so that's, that's the meat and potato of why I'm here. I'm sure you're going to cover that. <laughs> Maha just jumped on. Right. Do you want to introduce yourself? Just uh, where you teach, how long you've been teaching? Yes. Hi, I, um, my name is Maha Jibara. I teach at Mira Costa College and I've been teaching since 2012, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome. What do you teach, Maha? Oh, biostatistics. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed everybody's. <laughs> I was in a different meeting. So. Oh, that that we understand that's happening a lot today. But well, we can just start early and have a little extra time. Yeah, we'll have extra time. Okay. Deborah, is that all right with you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, then I would like to introduce our first speaker, Deborah Dalshanks, who I've known for. A good 20 years. She and I worked with FAC and CPFA and all sorts of great organizations. And she is just a wonderful, wonderful person. And she knows more about STIRS than STIRS does. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deborah Dalshanks and her presentation on STIRS. Deborah. Well, thank you. Um, David is right. We have been doing this for a very long time. Um, and I've been working with the FAP Retirement Committee for at least 20 years and the STRS part-time task force for almost about the same amount of time. So um, there is so many things to consider when you're looking at issues dealing with a retirement. And I need to push this thing off my screen. There we go. Okay. Really quick, we're doing a, a quick poll uh, just to give a little pre-knowledge. So. If you can click that poll, we'll, we'll close that in about a minute oh, and okay. then uh, start the PowerPoint. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And we did have a question in the chat already about the difference between DB and CB. So maybe you can answer that. Okay, um, STRS has two plans for um, that they um, run. Um, the DB plan, which is the defined benefit plan, that is the plan they've been running for over 100 years. And that is the plan that is required for all full-time faculty. Um, and it's also the only plan in every single district. Cash balance or the CB plan was started in the mid 1990s as an alternative for part-time faculty, especially those part-timers who have full-time private sector employment and would not um, vest in a uh, defined benefit type plan. So that was a new plan started in the mid 1990s, but it is not available in every school district throughout the state because it's negotiable. And we'll talk about their differences in a minute. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll and uh, share some results here. Okay. If I may ask, how do you know so much about it, Deborah? Well, back in the late 1990s, um, when I joined FAC, I asked them if they put me on a committee. I assumed they'd put me on the part-time faculty committee. They did not. They put me on the retirement committee. I thought they were crazy. Um, so I've been spending over 20 years learning about retirement for part-time faculty and doing lots, not only research, but attending lots of um, uh, workshops and just the amount of time to learn about it. It's, it's a very complex information. It's complex and uh, it's taken me uh, many years to figure it out. <laughs> Basically, you have been doing your homework. In essence, yeah. Good for, for you. For all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Deborah, we got the poll there. So if, you, if you can't see it, for those who can't yep. see it, it's about three fourths of the people in a STRS defined benefit program. Uh, almost half people have some social security. Um, most people uh, don't have different plans in different districts. Oh, well, and uh, probably about uh, two thirds of the people don't understand how their plan works. <laughs> so that's good we're here. Yes, yes, yes. 
that's good that you're not in a in a variety of plans in different districts because that's not a good thing. So it's good to be stable in one plan. It just you want to make sure that it's the right plan for you. So that would be the difference. So so I'm going to have Arnie just go to the next slide. And we're going to talk about preparing for retirement. And a lot of it is what you did in your um, questionnaire, which is you have to know the district you're in and the various districts you've worked in, what plan you're in. And I can tell you there are a lot of people don't always know what plan they're in um, because they may have been placed in a plan unknowingly when they were hired. And unless you're following it on your uh, pay stubs, you may not always know what plan you're in, but it's important that you do know what plan or plans you're in. Um, a lot of you have to, and like I hear some of people are looking at retiring. So part of understanding retirement is also knowing your expectations from your pension. What do you expect from your pension to do? Especially if you work multiple jobs, if you work in the private sector. Um, do you have an idea when you want to retire? What age? And sometimes the age you think you want to retire and that age when you really can afford to retire may not be the same. So you really need to consider um, all these various aspects of what you expect that pension to do and then what you plan on doing after you retire. There is life after retirement when you are no longer in the classroom. And of course, there are a lot of considerations to um, take into, effect, uh, into account um, where you're gonna get your health care. Do you have to, should I wait to retire till I'm 65 and I can get Medicare? Um, my housing, travel, take into consideration uh, how my spouse or partner fits in, how my children might fit in. Um, all the various aspects that are, are going to face you in post-teaching time frame has to be considered. Um, the earliest you can retire with STRS is age 55. Most people don't retire at the age of 55. The typical people who retire at 55 tend to be K through 12 teachers, mainly because they get so burnt out. The optimal age for the STRS plan, if you're in defined benefit, is 63. Um, it, is, it changed to the age of 65 if you were hired for the first time after 2013, but I would imagine most of you don't fall in that category. So the optimum age or the maxing out of some of certain aspects of the benefits <clears throat> is age 63. Statistically, however, most community college faculty, whether they're full-time or part-time, don't retire until late in their 60s and sometimes into their 70s mainly because they like doing what they do so much. Although I'm not sure if that's the case right now, um, but that is statistically where we're at. So let's change slides. Okay, so let's talk about the plans. Um, like I said, the state teachers retirement system has been around for over a hundred years. The defined benefit is available to all faculty, full-time, part-time and in every district. It is a it's defined, the reason it's called a defined benefit, it's defined by a formula based upon your work history, your, uh, which is your service credit, the age at which you retire. It's, and like I said, that maxes out at a factor um, at the age of 63. And then your earnable annualized earnings um, at the time uh, over the last three years or your highest three years, whichever is better. Um, other things available to part timers throughout the state is Social Security, not in every district. And then, of course, there are other odd plans that you may have encountered in other districts like Pear, Apple, insurance companies, etc. Um, the STRS, uh, and a lot of people asked about STRS and PERS. STRS and PERS, because they're both a state program for public employees, one for teachers, one for the basic public employees, have a reciprocating agreement 
meaning that if you happen to have had some work history in PERS that um, STRS recognizes it, and you automatically vest in both plans by virtue of vesting in one or the other of them. So there is an agreement between those two. And so if you have any work history in the opposite plan, they will give you a pension or a partial pension based on that agreement. So if anybody happens to have a, a need for a coordinated retirement. The other thing to remember about retiring, um, and that is you have to retire from all districts simultaneously, or if you're in STRS and PERS simultaneously, they expect, they don't expect you to say, oh, I'm going to retire from this district, but keep working in another district. You, uh, they do not allow that. You have to retire from everything simultaneously. Um, and one of the ways of keeping track of all this information is Going to the STRS website, the, the part-time task force has been in effect mm, off and on since the early 2000, I'd say about 2004. And we try to meet every year to keep up as to what are the issues facing part-timers and how STRS is adapting to those issues. And we haven't managed to make it always every year. And there's been a huge turnover of uh, employees at STRS over the last couple of years. They've had a lot of retirees, uh, retirements in their system. So we're spending some of our time educating the new staff of STRS. But important for you to know is they're putting much more information on their website. They're putting, they're rewriting their PowerPoint to be more tailored to part-time faculty needs and they're tailoring their new education workshops to be more tailored to our needs. Um, you should, if you don't have one, have a MyCalSTRS account so that you can um, find out all this information on a regular basis. And my thing got out of the way, let me thank you. Um, where you can find your annual statements. And there's more information on the annual statement online than they, than they would send out in paper form. So it's really important to read those statements because they now are um, giving more detailed information as to what the districts are reporting as to your earnings and your service credit. So that's very handy. Um, so, and that also lets you know if you happen to have a defunct cash balance plan or if you find yourself in multiple plans, that will be there. It also gives you an opportunity that if something doesn't look right as to your service credit, you can dispute incorrect information. Um, and we're, gonna, we're working with STRS to try to make this easier for part-timers to dispute incorrect information. They're also putting out next year in 2021, a new computer program, which again is going to help them track and help part-time faculty much better. It's called the Pension Solution um, Computer Program. And uh, we're hoping that that will help part-timers and as well as the STRS staff in helping part-timers get the information they need, as well as differentiating their individual needs and options. Okay, now really important considerations. Should I retire and return to work? People often talk about this, is that what's the benefit of retiring and returning to work? Well, there's benefits and there's downsides to anything you choose to do. Um, David chose to retire and return to work, um, only because I know that. And I have quite a few friends who have chosen to do that. Um, that means that you would retire, you would start collecting a STRS pension. And then after 180 day, what's called a sit out or zero to a zero dollar offset, because they wanted there to be a break in service, you can return to work. Now you return to work, still collecting your pension, but you now can earn money um, through your teaching again. The difference is, that your district would no longer be contributing to STRS. They would not be taking money out of your paycheck for STRS. 
but you also are not gaining any service credit. So again, for some people, it works well to retire, collect their pension, and then come back and work part-time. For others, they would rather just keep working um, until they're ready to just totally hang it up and then get the maximum uh, pension that they can. Um, the other really interesting thing is you can, if you are 65, you can start collecting your social security. Do not, or you can put off your STRS pension until later. If you stop, if you continue working in STRS, doing credible service, as long as you're doing that, there is no offset against your social security. So I know quite a few people who chose to retire at 65, collect their social security and Medicare, but continue working, teaching and adding money and service credit into their STRS because there is no offset with, the, with social security until you actually start accepting money from STRS. So that is an option if you want to avoid the WEP for a certain amount of time down the road. Um, and as I said, be sure to read your annual report. Uh, someone asked a question about sick leave. And so um, sick leave is a very interesting thing. When you retire, you are not paid for your unused sick leave. If you are in defined benefit, those unused sick leave hours are sent to STRS as service credit. So you will gain service credit from unused sick leave. If you are in cash balance, social security or any other plan, you lose your unused sick leave. You are not paid for them. It just, it stays in the computer. You don't benefit by having not been sick. So the only, only plan in which you benefit from unused sick leave is the STRS DB plan. Um, the other thing, other benefits to the DB plan is the supplement, the DBS. So when you look in your annual report, you'll find a separate page that says defined benefits supplement. It's a separate savings account that has been set up for anything over 100% or work you might have done uh, between 2000 and 2010 that was added into this special savings account. And when you go to retire, you, it's, it's basically just money. You can't roll it into your DB plan. Um, you can roll it into an IRA. Uh, you can take it as an annuity. Uh, you can just cash it out and say, here, give me five or 10 or 20 or whatever thousands of dollars might be in that plan. You can take it. Um, the other thing that uh, might affect some of you is if you have a work history that predates a, um, 1996 as a part-timer, there was a law written called AB 1586. And when they changed the way they did computations in the mid nineties, it inadvertently disadvantaged the older part-timers or part-timers who had a, um, a work history that predated that date. And so they wrote this law. So if you have a work history that predates 1996 and you look at your annual statement, just remember this, that would be the minimum projected retirement. It will probably go up from there because they will do a special calculation for you because you're part of that group that predates 1996. And the other thing to remember when reading your annualized statement, your annualized statement does not include your unused sick leave. So again, that's the minimal amount of money you would receive in a pension given at projections because it doesn't include that information as well. So remember, you've got the website to go to, your account to look at, review your reports, forms calculators. The calculators are wonderful for getting a sense of projecting how long I have to work to get the kind of pension I want to receive. Um, if you're looking at retiring soon, all the forms are there. You can do everything online to um, apply for retirement. Uh, the only thing that you would have to probably print off of there is the express benefits form, which has to go to your district payroll department because they have to report your unused sick leave to STRS. Um, 
Sturz recommends that you see a counselor at least five years before your desired date to retire so they can review what you've done, if you need to um, assign a beneficiary, uh, et cetera. Um, it gives you a, a, at least a spotlight as to where you're going and what you think you're going to need. Um, most, of the, most of the time, Sturz does recommend seeing a counselor the year of or a year before you want to retire. So you can review all this information, ask them any pertinent questions, find out if there's any um, special issues you have to look into. I found there was a special issue with mine and I'm really happy that I went and saw a counselor because we found a mistake that we had to work on. So it's oftentimes in your benefit to do that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, why don't you go ahead and jump one. The next slide is a lot of data. Um, a lot of people always tell me that they're afraid that for some reason, uh, will there be money there to retire? You know, they're looking at the, the stock market and they are looking at the economy and they're worried about investments. And I can tell you this, CalSTRS is one of the most fiscally prudent, big, retirement companies or retirement systems, not only in the state of California, but probably in the whole United States. Um, it has tremendous assets. You will see there 262 billion in assets. Um, it also has uh, various set-asides for helping people. The one thing I didn't mention was the other thing that they have is they have a plan for helping people maintain um, purchase power called the, um, uh, shoot, my brain just went blank, blank. Um, the MDM, MDS um, account. And it's not your own personal account. It is a separate set of money Stur sets aside to help people as they age if inflation catches up with their pension. And this has helped greatly, especially um, K through 12 teachers, mainly women who find themselves living into their 90s because teachers tend to have longevity. And many of these women retired back in the 60s and 70s and inflation just has eaten them alive. But this, this particular um, account will bolster their retirement. It keeps pumping it up extra money way beyond what they had paid into it to make sure that they have um, a viable uh, pension for living. Um, so this is just kind of some general information uh, on the actuarials, et cetera, et cetera, which is not terribly interesting for most people. So we'll jump to one more page, which takes us to the Q&A page. Um, so I don't know if anybody has a specific question on cash balance, but it's really important to understand cash balance was designed for people who only seldom teach, like you only teach on the weekend or you only teach a night class and you have a really good daytime pension from like a private sector job. Um, cash balance was not intended for people who are career teachers. So if you're a career teacher and you're in cash balance, you may be in the wrong plan for you and you might consider if you um, shifting over to defined benefit, if you choose to do that, you can consolidate the cash balance money into the DB plan and it will purchase back um, some of your service credit. Uh, and that's called a, an account consolidation. There's information about it on the CalSTRS website. Let's see, uh, service credit. Can we ask? Sure, go ahead and so why don't you go ahead and ask a question now? Why? So I, when I joined uh, MiraCosta, uh, you know, I, I work 40, 50, I work 50% on average. Uh, so I, um, they encouraged, I, I was set to go into um, a defined benefit, but the person there told, told me, no, 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 as an associate faculty, you should go for cash balance. So I did, and then seven years later, I realized it was a big mistake, and I switched to DB. 
And for the last two years, I've been trying to, uh, to move that. And I have some money from Washington mm -hmm. trying to consolidate and put it into my defined benefit, but it's been stuck. So I call them so many times uh, because there's some error in something in Miracosta and they, they have a system where they send it through the system, but they never respond and they never get an answer. And I talk to the people at Miracosta, they say, we never received anything. And I talk to them and I can't get it to move. It's just stuck. And, but even then, as I'm thinking about all of this, and by the time I, I probably have to put in 50,000 to vest, and then taking into account social security, uh, uh, the social security, AB, whatever it's called, the uh, windfall and all that. I think I, it's not even worth it. It's like money down the drain as if, I mean, unless I'm not calculating it correctly. I mean, I can't get a good calculation to how much I really will earn and how much actually take away for windfall elimination. You know, I'll be on my husband's social security because I have zero social security to speak of. So I, I'm stuck and I have no idea how to proceed. Well, you're probably your best, your best, best thing to do is to, um, I would say, originally I would say contact a counselor, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're stuck trying to get the consolidation to go through, I then have you been need, I'm calling them and phoning them, nothing. Yeah, yeah. You need to contact the Calsters um, uh, office of the ombudsman. Office of the Ombudsman? Yes. Their job is to problem solve these issues. And um, they're very knowledgeable about um, part-time faculty and they're very knowledgeable about account consolidations. Mm. Um, and talk to them about it, especially if you've already put through the paperwork to do the consolidation. Um, mm. Then you need to find out what specific is the hangup. And once you get the specific information as to what the hangup is, um, then they probably would have better advice as to how to proceed. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know who to call because I've called them so many times. I say, oh, we'll get back to you in 24 hours. It never happens. Oh, yeah. they said, we, we have a system. We send it out. But who knows where that thing is going? And I, I can't get them to talk to each other. It's so yeah. weird. No, that's not. That's actually not terribly weird. But um, it's consolidation. Let me tell you something about how I look at consolidation. Consolidation and investing in defined benefit is to me no different than if I were in taking $50,000 that I might have in an IRA or whatever um, and investing it in an IRA. The difference between investing in CalSTRS and investing in an IRA, in my opinion, is the fact that CalSTRS cannot be lost if the stock market goes down. Mm -hmm. An IRA can. It's absolutely guaranteed the payout is guaranteed for your life. No matter if you live to be 150, they would continue paying you no matter what, even if you ran out of your money. Whereas money going into IRAs or annuities tend to be, are very finite and are susceptible to the whims of the stock market, recessions, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm I always sorry. consider an investment in STRS as a very sound, um, a very sound investment that's going to stick be stuck be be there for you sorry one more thing I, i'm still not clear if it's even worth it though for me because i think uh, by the time i retire it'll be like five or six hundred dollars a month which is not very much and then 400 goes to the windfall elimination i'll be left with 200 is it even worth all this money no 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 nothing is take, windfall elimination takes nothing from your stirs Oh, what about the other one? There's, there's two of them, windfall elimination and- Nothing, nothing, nothing can be taken from your STRS. STRS is STRS. STRS is a guaranteed pension. The windfall okay. elimination provision in GPO affects a social security pay and payout. It does not affect STRS. No, I know but it's a social, I mean, if you compare it to what I get from my husband with the social security, then it's essentially all gone. It's, it's not worth it even. It's like I'm putting money down the drain. Well, I think I'll, I, I mean, if you look at that, how much in comparison I lose from Social Security, it works out to like 200 a month then. Well, if I'm doing the calculation right, I can't get anyone to tell me how much really it is. 
Well, the actual calculation, as I understand it, is this, that whatever your pension is, is offset dollar for dollar against a government pension. In other words, against a, a spousal social security. So it, mm -hmm. yeah. So it really doesn't matter. It's gonna come out about the same, no matter what you do. So is it worth it then? Why don't I take the money and invest it and I'll, that would not be offset, right? Uh, that is true, it would not be offset. I would still do the consolidation, but you do not have to take the 50,000 and put it into STRS because the consolidation still is gonna get you a better payout at the other end and move, and move your cash balance over as opposed to keeping it in two separate entities. Right. But you could, I mean, if you, that's absolutely true. Okay, so you mean if we get 550 from STRS, they take 550 from social security. Yeah, yes. I mean, they take 550 from a spousal amount of social security. If it's your own social security, then it's a different amount. It's about half. So if you're getting 550 from STRS and you're getting your own social security of 550, they would take about $225 or $200 from your social security. Widow's benefits, absolutely. It works the same for widow's benefits. If you, if you're, um, so if your husband gets social security and then technically you get half his social security, it's that half of the social security has that 550 taken from it. If your spouse dies and the widow's benefit is now not that little half, but you now get 100% of your husband's social security, that is offset dollar for dollar against the STRS. The idea is that they don't want you to benefit Let's see, there's no memory. Yes, the 180 day rule. Now remember the 180 day rule is this. 180 Carol will be talking more about the windfall elimination. No, 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 not the, not the windfall elimination provision. Someone's asking about if I retire and wanna come back to work, Sturz will say that there's a 180 day rule. 180 days means that you can't it does not mean you cannot work for 180 days. It means that if you come back and work within that 180 days, there's a dollar for dollar offset against your pension. So you can earn money. And if you're earning decent enough money, take it aside, put it in, you know, put a lot of, put it in the bank. And then when STRS charges you again, an offset against your pension, then you have it. Oh, and the other question is, you can also be collecting your pension. If you go back to work, you are still eligible for unemployment. Mm. Can you explain that again? Okay, so let's say you, you retire and you start collecting your pension. And then you say, I want to go back and work part time. So I'm going to collect my pension. And I'm going to work part time and earn money during the summertime or during winter breaks. You can still apply for unemployment even though you're collecting a pension. Thank you. Can we, oh. as, as an adjunct, um, I'm fairly new. Um, I heard that we can collect as an adjunct and I only work six hours a week. Can, can I collect unemployment for Christmas break, Thanksgiving break, summer? Thanksgiving break, no, because you're still in the midst of a semester, which means you have a reasonable um, assurance of coming back after Thanksgiving. Winter break, yes, you can collect unemployment there because there is no assurance of being uh, rehired in January or going back to work in January because it would be dependent upon funding and the classes filling. Same is true in summer. You can collect unemployment during summer for the same reason that there is no guarantee or contract that uh, guarantees you returning to work in August or September. Okay, so what what would happen, like for instance, I, I wanna like take care of my mom during the summer and um, so I don't accept the summer assignment. Would I still be eligible for unemployment? 
Yes. Okay. So even if, because I, with unemployment, it was supposed to be that, you know, the, the, the job dropped you, you didn't drop the job. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, it, you know, it can be a variety of reasons. It could be that a person turns down the assignment because it's a class they didn't feel that they were qualified enough to teach or they didn't feel competent in it. There are a lot of reasons why one can turn down a job, we turn down an offering of a course. Okay, and still collect unemployment. Yeah, the other, because then the other thing say, is, you can say that you're looking for, you want, you're looking for, um, you know, work in a specific realm of teaching and maybe that class didn't fill that. Okay, thank you. As, as long as you don't tell unemployment, I turned down that job. Yeah, it's highly tell. unlikely that the district is going to is going to tell them to is even going to know that because it would take your dean notifying HR that you turned it down, and then HR, when they get the thing from uh, unemployment, asking you know, I mean, it it really it, it has to go through so many layers that it's really unlikely that they would that they would ever get to it. So just fill out, you know, so just when you fill out your unemployment thing, just pretend, don't even say anything about turning it down. Okay, so it's basically summer and Christmas. That's it, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the same thing. The same rule would apply for Easter break. So if you took a week off at Easter, you can't get unemployment for that week at Easter because it's in the middle of a semester. Uh, okay, thank, thank you so much. Now you can, however, if you've been on unemployment, and let's say when you come back to work, your assignment goes from, let's say, teaching three classes to one class, you can continue receiving unemployment as being underemployed. Okay. So they will look at that as well. So if suddenly what you had been earning was significantly more, now it's gone down because your assignment, your assignments have gone down, there is an underemployment yeah, like, a, and then you'll get like partial unemployment. You get partial, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, let's see. Sabine, you asked the question about sick leave added to the three highest years. Remember, sick leave is for your whole history of teaching, and it's everything you've accumulated in unused sick leave goes to your service credit at the time of retirement uh, in the form of service credit has nothing to do with your your income or highest three years of earnings or whatever okay what so do we what do we do with service credit the service credit is part of um the formula for the defined benefit pension so your service credit is your history of working uh, over your lifetime um in what we would call full-time equivalent years as it all kind of as added together um, and so that's part of the formula. Your formula for retirement is the service credit times an age factor given to the formula for you math people um, based upon your age. And the highest factor is at age 63 um, or 65, depending on when you were hired. And then your earnable, which is basically taking your earnings and translating it into the equivalent of one year of earnings. So let's, uh, the simplest way of explaining an earnable is if you work a 50% load and earn $25,000 for that 50% load, STRS will put it into the formula at $50,000. They will turn it into a one-year equivalent of earnings. And that goes into this formula and that's how they figure out your pension. Okay. And that pension is um, the base pension, and that would be for your lifetime. And then every year there is a 2% COLA added, simple COLA added to that pension. Deb, I have a question. Yeah. On that age, the, uh, the maximum age factor, when you say it's 63, uh, uh, it's 65 if you were hired after uh, 2007, is it 65 if you join STRS DB after then, or? if you were actually hired, because I just joined STRS DB, but I was hired back in 2000. No, it is based upon your first date of hire, and that would be the year 2013. So the fact that you have a work history that predates 2013, you would be part of the 63 
Okay. Group. All right. Thanks. And I, I have a weird story that I started before 1997 and worked for the district for 13 years. And then I took almost 20 years off and now I'm back and I'm on my second year. It still goes from your original date of hire. But you know, what's kind of funny is they, they didn't, I was trying to blend everything together and they acted like I was a new employee in everything. Well, they probably acted as you were a new employee, but STRS doesn't. They look at your complete history all the way back to original date of hire. Okay. <sighs> I think we had a question uh, from Farrell about pensions and disbursement. If you retire and your pension's about 50K, how is that dispersed? If you're pen, okay. And Farrell, if you want to unmute and just explain it, that'd be great too. Is it on here? On yeah, list? it's, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you sound great. Okay. Um, let's say you retired and you had 50K in your DB, whatever. Um, how does that work? I mean, how do, how, do they, how do they calculate what your pension will be? Yeah, they don't care about the fact you have $50,000 in your DB because it's a defined benefit. Um, if you happen to see your account and it says you have $50,000, it's really irrelevant. That's the that's telling you the amount of money. If you if you decided to withdraw from the plan, they would give you your fifty thousand dollars back. Right. With DB, it's strictly the formula. So the amount of money in there is really irrelevant because it's not only funded by your fifty thousand dollars. There's oh, the right. district's fifty thousand right. dollars. Right. Right. There's the interest that's been uh, accruing through their investments, the state puts in another 2.5%. And so there's significantly more money in there, but you can't just go in there and say, well, give me my money. Right. <laughs> um, it's the DB is strictly formula based. And as everyone says that if the first set, the first seven years you're retired, you're basically kind of paying down your money. If you retire and you live another 20 years, you're now pulling money from what the district put in and you're pulling money from the investments of STRS, et cetera. Ah, so it's all based on the formula. Gotcha. So what, in other words, once they, they have to do, once they do that formula, then they can give you a projection on- that, Yes, and that's the benefit of talking to a counselor a couple exactly. of years before you're looking to retire because they can look at your current status right. and say, well, this is where you stand right now. In fact, if you go into your annual statements, if you're mm -hmm. close to retirement, they'll project the next, if you retired next year, 2021, they'll project what it would be if you retired in 2022, and they'll project what you might get if you retire in 2023. So you will actually get pre-projections in your annual statements. The thing to remember about those projections, they don't include your unused sick leave, which will add more uh, service credit. Which means um, more, yeah. Yeah, so remember your sick leave will add more service credit, but they don't know how much sick leave you've got. Right. There's exactly. no way for them to add that into the formula. Right. So like I said, if you look at the projection in your annualized report, that is the minimum you would be getting. You know it will be more because of the fact there will be still more service credit to come. Okay. Thank yeah, you. We have about two minutes. Yeah. And then later, we'll just talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Rose actually had a question that might even be good to hang on to because I know uh, Carlin is going to talk about WEP some more. Yep. So maybe we can hold off. And then Rose, if you don't get the question answered, we'll, we'll be around to answer it uh, towards the end of Carlin's presentation. Ah, and um, Car, oh, never mind. OK, that's good. <laughs> I was looking at this question. It was like, had to do with service credit. Um, I would say this. Service credit is not always an exact science based upon the way your districts uh, report it. So if you know you're working a 60% load and you look at your annualized report and it says 59 or 61 or 62% or 58%, that's probably about as close as your district can get. If it's way off the mark, then there's a problem with how they're reporting you. And then that's when you need to go and dispute your service credit record for that year or find out how it got reported incorrectly. So 
So that's why it's really important to um, get that Mike Houster's account and do check it um, once, at least once a year. Okay. Okay, Dara, uh, Deborah, thank you yeah. so much. It's, it's always <laughs> wonderful to hear your information that is so vitally important to everyone, to all of us. So uh, you'll, there'll be another se uh, breakout session with Deborah at um, 3.40 at, at, towards the end of the meeting. The last 20 minutes of the meeting will be a breakout session where you can ask more specific questions. Now I'd like to welcome uh, Carlin Albee who will be talking about social security, um, a little more about WebGPO and then the various issues with social securities that will be important. So Carlin, are you over there? I am here. Great. Marty, you need to bring the PowerPoint back up. Okay, my uh, subject that I've been assigned is WEP and GPO, and I'm going to start with hers, and then I'll go on to some information I prepared. I always blame WEP on President Reagan. He didn't like people that were double dippers. He didn't like it when they collected a p government pension and Social Security. So he came up with this brilliant idea, and... Um, that's where our problem is. But the funny part is it only affects, I think it's, somebody said 14 states in the United States, not all 50 states have it. Because a lot of schools in other states do pay both social into Social Security and their retirement pro, uh, problems. So this is kind of unique to California. And what it works for is that their idea is if you're collecting Social Security, and you are getting a government pension, then you shouldn't get as much Social Security. And I'll show you a chart later on about that. Um, so they're just saying they don't want you to double dip. The WEP affects people's earned Social Security benefits. This is what we have earned as our own being the employee ourselves. And then uh, Jimmy Carter came along and he said, well, wait a minute, that's for the, the people that earned it, but what about the widows that are collecting money? And that's where the government pension offset came from. Um, we'll, we can blame that on him. You know, obviously it's Congress that does it, but he let it go through. And that, um, Deborah gave a really good explanation on the GPO. So I um, want to specify one thing. Here is her slide, she's got it really good. Like she says, it's a women's issue. And one of the things that I have noticed that from talking to some friends of mine is that if you are a widow and you got a divorce from that guy long before he died, you're still considered a widow, but um, this still affects you. And the other thing about social security is if you're a widow and you were um, married to that person for over 10 years, at least 10 years, you could still possibly get some social security from them. And so it's very important that you ask social security. It doesn't cost you a cent to ask social security. Okay. Um, and looking down at the bottom, if the retired teacher has a survivor's benefit on their pension, their spouse is still going to get that full amount. So it's, it's really one-sided. It, it affects those of us that are teachers. Uh, next slide. All right, there we go. Okay, now I love this chart. I had never seen this chart before. I think it is wonderful. It is five examples. So fully vested in Social Security. The minimum to be vested in Social Security is you have to have 10 years that you paid into Social Security. And that now they don't word it that way. They say 40 quarters, four quarters to a year times 10. So they don't have to be consecutive. Okay, so your spouse who worked outside the home is vested in Social Security. They earned the 40%. So the spouse collects the, the 100%. And then you can see on this chart, 50% and then the spouse, we'll say the teacher, gets 50% as the spouse on that social security. Number two, the spouse never paid into social security at all. 
they're going to collect 100 percent of well the worker is going to get their monthly amount the 2700 and the spouse is going to get 50 percent of that 1383 the third one again the spouse stayed at home didn't work never paid into it the employee did collect 100 percent on their social security same amount 27 the spouse is going to get 50 percent so it's still the same amount now here we get into what applies to us here's the teacher didn't pay into social security their spouse is who was the one paying into social security gets 100 percent but the spouse, the teacher, doesn't get anything while they're working because they had the public school benefit. Now, this is under uh, GPO. And that benefit is going to be um, just the amount for the spouse because the offset is $2 for every $3 in the pension. So if the pension for every $3 of pension amount they're going to deduct two dollars from that from from the social security. It's not being deducted from the the pension. Nobody takes money out of your pension. This is strictly a calculation of how much social security you will get. And then here comes number five, and this is me. You earn forty quarters in social security and other jobs. Well, many of you teach at more than one district. I didn't. I worked as an accountant. So I have my own 40 quarters. Now, if I was married, which I'm not, um, my, my spouse would be getting 100% of their Social Security, and the GPO penalty would be applied to the spouse benefits, which means that if I was trying to get that half of their benefit, going back to that 1383, it would be eliminated because of my pension. So that's when you have to stop and look at your own social security base compared to what you would get as a spouse on social security and figure out which one's better. I know my neighbor figured out she was better off getting her own social security instead of being a spouse on her husband's account. And it, and it kind of works out based on what your income was compared to the spousal benefit. So it is worth looking into. And as David said, this chart will be available to you. Okay, so that's the end of that one. And I don't believe there's a next slide. Okay, this is the one I wanted to bring to you. Now, Cal Sturs came out with this flyer. It's two pages long and it's really good. And I'm very grateful to Arnie for making it into the PowerPoint. This chart is available in this. You can go to the CalSTRS website and get it. That's where I downloaded it. And it's a really good example of how the windfall elimination provision is going to affect you if you've got Social Security earnings. Now, the windfall elimination provision is for your earnings and your Social Security. Okay. Uh, the substantial earnings chart here, I'm going to give you, a, show you a full one and we'll have it in a bit. And it's a full explanation. Go to the next page. This page is the same two page flyer from Calsters, but this page is talking about the government pension offset. Now, remember the government pension offset is you collecting as the spouse of somebody that paid into Social Security. Okay, so there's two different systems here. WEP, WEP is for you and your Social Security. GPO is when you are trying to collect as the spouse. And on GPO, again, if you never had any um, Social Security earnings of your own, and even if you're a divorcee, um, if you had been married over 10 years with them, you are still, it's still possible you could get money from them. Next page. All right, now this one looks a little small here. Um, it comes from the Social Security website. This is the substantial earnings that they're talking about. Now, I'm going to show you a chart in a minute, but start out with this one. 
when did you start working? Well, I first my first W-2 job I referred to was back in 68. It was considered substantial earnings if you had earned $1,950 in the entire year. So when they say, do you have so many years of substantial earnings? This is the chart they're referring to. By 1990, that amount had gone up to 9,525. Okay, so if you had made in 1990, if you had made an earnings that paid into social securities, these are social security earnings. If you had made at least 9,525, that's another year of substantial earnings. 2020, it's all the way up to 25,575. Inflation has really hit us, hasn't it? Okay, now when we talk about a percentage, see that next little chart right there in the bottom right hand corner, years of substantial earnings? I've got over 30 years as an accountant. So I get 90% of my social security and David understands this 90% better than me, but basically I get any social security I would have gotten, I get. If you had 20 years or less, you get 40%. Now, I have a problem with this chart because is it, this is deducted from your social security or is it what's uh, left over? But David is gonna okay. say that real quick because he understands it better than I do. Yeah, real quickly, this is how much you keep of the first tier because for social security, they break it into up to nine hundred dollars, the nine hundred. There's different tiers, and you get a different percentage of that money. Well, for this first nine hundred dollars of your Social Security, you with thirty uh, years, you keep ninety percent of that. Okay, but in my case, I only had ten years, which means is twenty or less. So I keep forty percent of my um, Social Security payment. So mine was supposed to be five hundred seventy-five dollars. I only get 40% of my 575. Then they take out Medicare and I'm left with $99. So it isn't for the maximum, it would be 40% um, of the $900, which is where the people get the $400, $450 amount. Um, but it, it depends on how much your social security is. Mine wasn't that much. And then how long you had it. And so mine was down at 40% because I had 10 years of service. And Maha, I saw your question. I'm going to answer it in a minute. I am so glad that David understands that tier business because I got a mental block on it. But I understand the basics. And there is something they told us when I had a speaker that came for Social Security. They said, you will always get at least a minimum of 50% of whatever your Social Security is. So keep that in mind. Okay, so this is their chart. It's available on um, the Social Security website, which is ssa.gov. And I've also, uh, it'll be in this package that you can get if you want it today. And I also have posted it to Facebook to our account under files. Next slide. So Carlin, that's all the slides I had time to put on. So oh, we're going to okay. have to go manually to share the you different documents. So just keep talking chart. about it and let me know I which will. document you want. And yeah, then I'll try to put it on. Chart, that chart, um, they had a couple of the years were individual years, like 98, 99, you know, those were individual, but sometimes they'd show a bracket. And so what I did, being the accountant that I am, I love Excel. I can do just about anything on Excel. And I took and created a worksheet. And I've got a blank one on the Facebook. You'll get it and um, we'll send it to you. There it is. And you need to see the full thing. This is the blank one. And if you can fill it up, what I have done is I went through that chart and in column A, you see the years our column B is all those years, and it goes back to when I started working. Don't put any numbers in there yet, because that's the next one I want you to do. So in column C, those are those the substantial earnings annual amount based on that chart you just saw that's on the Social Security website. 
Okay, so I went all the way down. You can see that 1950 from 1968 when I first started working. And I updated it last night. As Carol pointed out, 2020 is 25,575 down at the end, okay? Now, if he puts up the next one, this is what mine looks like. Beautiful. Thank you, Arnie. Now, this is what happens is if you uh, go up to the top, what I have done, this is filled out for me. The working Sorry, year. Wrong one here. Year. There's the years again. And the substantial earnings according to that chart from Social Security. Okay. Oops, it disappeared, Arnie. I have the wrong one up. You just have to no, wait. No, you didn't. Put it that up. was the one I wanted. That was perfect timing. Give me a couple seconds, just a second. I am. I'm very patient. So then you have to go to Social Security. And if you haven't already done so, you need to set up my account. And then my account, you go in there and you get your earnings history, your own personal history. And there's going to be two columns on it. One column is going to be for what you what was your Social Security earnings and one is your Medicare earnings. Now, the difference is for these substantial earnings, you need to put in your earnings. So col column C again is the substantial earnings from that chart. The next one, my Social Security earnings, column D, that's what you have to input for each of those years based on your earnings record. The next one was Medicare earnings. That has nothing to do with this calculation, but as long as it was in front of me, I did it just because it's kind of funny to look at the Medicare because we pay into Medicare as teachers. We don't pay into Social Security. And so you can see the differences there. So now, column F, I set up the formula. And as you fill it in, it will automatically calculate that percentage. It'll do the math for you. So what you are doing is taking your Social Security earnings and dividing it by your substantial earnings column to see what percentage does it count. Now, if Arnie can move us up, Okay, so Maha, you asked where do you get the value for the substantial earnings? That substantial earnings column C is the chart that I just showed you that was from the Social Security website. Okay, it's also, it was like two, two pages ago for us. It'll, it's also available on our Facebook page under files. These two are under um, files under Facebook, but look at what I did here now. So I took my social security earnings divided by the substantial and I came up with a percentage. If that percentage is 100% or more, I went ahead for column G and I started counting my years. Okay, so all those years that I worked as an accountant, I was paying into social security. You can see a couple of years where I wasn't working as an accountant. I was trying to teach at two different colleges. All right, we have about two more minutes, okay? okay. So you would want to number those. Now the my earnings, my social security earnings, you got that last Carol just pointed out from my account in social security, they will have your history. So you count up all these years that you had substantial earnings. See, I'm at 32. That's why I get my full social security. That other little chart we had, remember the one from the social security website and over in the bottom right hand corner, it said how many years? That's why the number of substantial earnings is so important. Okay, and there's that's it. Um, that'll give you all the basics. You need to go into Social Security and set up my account to get your earnings history and find out what they show as you having earned. Okay. Okay, great. And there will be additional time in the breakout. You can ask. Um, this is very complicated and Carlin did a great job of pointing out how many variables and how many problems people can have. You know, I don't think it's in the in the breakout room. So let me real quick address another question. Somebody asked what about combining PERS and STRS? And I'm the one to ask because I did it. Um, I have STRS retirement and PERS and I had been told make sure you retire the same exact day. 
-hmm. on paper. So I go to STRS, they tell me what my benefit's gonna be. These are the years, fine. Then I go over to the PERS appointment. He tells me what my, um, here's your years, here's your pay. This is what you're gonna get. But my pay was like piddly amount, like $300 a month or 200 a month under PERS. And he said, oh wait, you had STRS, didn't you? I said, yeah. He said, we're gonna use your STRS income to do the calculation. So they're separate systems. They do not combine, but PERS will use it for the calculation of your pension. That's it. Thank okay, you. Okay, Carlin, thank you so much. And Arnie has a, a, a poll for you right now. If everyone present could pick the topics they would like to break into or topic, and we will put you into those groups, or you can stay in the main room and we'll have a discussion of other issues. Um, we have a, a closing conversation um, that we're going to have as soon as you finish the poll. Oh, Rosa, to answer your question, if you retire from PERS, they will not take that calculation into effect. You had to have uh, done it on the same day. So did everyone complete the poll? Arnie, do you have the information? We've got nine out of 16. Okay. I I'd give it a, another minute really quick. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll set up a breakout room for the Social Security Web GPO. And anyone who, who's not interested in that will have a general room here. And then please, if you can, describe uh, in the chat if you wanted to set up another room or if you get an idea for another breakout room during this next discussion, uh, we can adjust that depending on your, your desires. So uh, we'll continue now. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Arnie. Um, so people will be going into groups right into the stirs breakout i'm not exactly sure how this works i, um, I think at, I, they will be going into the breakouts after we do the the group the the first ah. group conversation <laughs> thank you carol thank you carol. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay uh, what we'd like to do is is before we go into the breakout rooms is have a group conversation with everyone on what you would like to see send uh excuse me sadafa doing to improve part-time working conditions on all campuses in San Diego County and hopefully influencing the entire state. Um, we can work on campus activities, legislative activities statewide. What topics, what issues are just importance to you? And we'll open that conversation up to everyone, obviously, and just have a group discussion. Uh, this happened to me. I've, I've been working at City College for 20 years and when I was first hired there, I mean, I didn't even go to HR to fill out my paperwork. It was given to me through my department chair. And I was told, you know, oh, you just sign up for this, uh, the alternate retirement plan. And I was told, I was actually told you can't, you, you can't even do CalSTRS. I don't even remember what the papers said, but if you think about it to the district, they would rather have a part-time person be in the alternate plan because they're only paying three and a half percent, I think, of our salary is their contribution. Like we pay three and a half, they pay three and a half. That's less than if, if we were, if they were having to pay social security. If we are in STRS defined benefit, we pay, and I mean, maybe Deborah knows the exact, I don't know the exact percentage now. I think we're paying, a, it's right around 10% something like that. And the district is paying uh, more because of funding. So do you know what that percentage is, Deborah? Yeah, um, it was up around 19%, 19 and a quarter percent. But uh, the state, because of the uh, problems with COVID and all the problems that districts are having, they have rolled back the state's, uh, the, the district's contributions um, down to about 18%. Um, and so they're giving them not that that's right. a huge amount, but I right. guess when you're talking about big numbers, I guess it is. So, uh, but the, the district pays significantly high into STRS DB compared to cash balance, social security, anything else. Right. What and is so the cash right. balance amount? Huh? Cash balance is like 4% or something, isn't it? Yeah, it's 4% right. and 4% um, district, 4% faculty member. Right. Um, and so that's why a cash balance pension or um, basically it's a type of annuity uh, is so low compared to a real pension. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, and you, there should be somebody, the HR department, they should be on top of that, but they're not. And they, you know, they want to save the money. 
So I would say to all adjuncts, everybody needs to know what their, you know, what their options are and, and talk to your other, if you know other adjuncts, you know, ask them, do you know about this? Are you, you know, are you, are you in, you know, CalSTRS defined benefit? Um, and, you know, and, and also push, you know, push your union to, they should be more on top of it too. Cause it really is. I mean, I've been totally screwed. I have 20 years in this stupid plan where I have like $45,000 for retirement. Um, where if I'd been in, 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 you know, and I couldn't, you know, and, and I've just now gotten into ca uh, defined benefit, I'm going to have to buy credit to, in order to vest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I know that there's a lot of us that have been now, granted, there are people who are working other full time jobs where where the the um, cash balance would be a better option. But for most of us, yeah defined benefit would yeah. it definitely would ends up being the best thing yeah. and like i say they they do i think they do yeah. purposely try to just if i if i could jump in there carol uh the, they they do and the the union the full-time faculty when they're hired just going to define benefit right and that's what everyone's looking at and the union and the administration are not really caring or looking at what are we doing for our part-time faculty the college like well let's spend as little as what money as we can, 4% is great, nothing would be better. So they're not pushing defined benefit. The union may or may not be paying attention to this. Um, they know. That's what Sadafa, CPFA and other organizations are here for, is to give information to part-timers as soon as possible. So if on your first day you sign up with Apple or some stupid little plan like that, the first time you hear about STIRS defined benefit, Go get that information. Do it. Uh, there's too many people I've talked to who are in their 60s and go, Dave, so I should start thinking about retirement now. <laughs> Do it as I, soon as you can. I was going to say, David, one of the things that FAC is working on, along with a couple of the other, I'll call it big players out there, is that we want to work over the next year talking to STIRS about making STIRS defined benefit the default legal default for all faculty, including part-time faculty, and that we're going to work out a plan with STIRS so that that part-time faculty member has a six-month window to opt out of defined benefit and into either cash balance or security or something other if they don't think it's appropriate for them. Because the majority of part-time faculty members tend to be more career or long-term faculty. So that's one of the things we want to do to try to fix that problem. And then you don't have the problem of them steering you down the wrong path. You automatically go into the better plan. You then have to choose to be in a lesser plan. Now, now of course, that there's an issue of the W, what's it called again? The GPO and the WE. Yeah. Really, if you're not going to be working long enough, may or not may not be beneficial because it's the throwing money into the defined benefit which you which is just going to be deducted your social security piece will be deducted whichever way you look at it so that might be a waste of money as well i well, feel we are in a no man's land which I, whatever we do <laughs> well the problem is is that if you had the option in your district to have to be to choose social security you could choose Social Security instead of STIRS, but not every district offers Social Security. Oh, maybe that's what we should also be working on. And that's something else we've been talking about doing is to have a piece of legislation that would require that both STIRS and Social Security be offered in every district so that you have a, a choice and then you make the, in, you know, the informed choice as to what's best for you. But, but Deborah, is STIRS going to jump on that idea? Because STIRS is the social security alternative. So no, they're competing. Social mm, no, actually. Um, Unless you get both, if you get both, but. Yeah, to get both. Can't get both. Uh, only PERS people, you know, this is the issue. You know, if you're a PERS person um, and, and work in a school district, um the district pays into both social security and pers so if you're a uh, school janitor or you're a school secretary they pay into both for you so they don't have offsets they don't have wep no if you if they pay into both then there is no wep 
as a school secretary, your district is paying into PERS and Social Security, which means by paying into both, there is no offset. Only the faculty are the ones that are being affected by um, the weapon GPO. Wow, amazing. Well, Deborah, I have a question. If the colleges are always already suffering under the high STRS contribution, if you say, now we want to add 6% on top of that for Social Security. No, no, no. STIR, the state has already voted um, that STRS and Social Security are separate for educators. What we're saying is we're asking that there be legislation that every district offer Social Security as one of the options for part-time faculty to choose. Right now, it's totally negotiable. Many of the districts don't offer Social Security as an option when you're hired. True, but that means that if they take Social Security, they will not be taking STIRS. That would be, the, but, but we're simultaneously saying that STIRS DB would be the default you would have to choose and sign a, a signature saying, I am not choosing to stay with the with STIRS, I will choose Social Security. Ah, so okay. what you would be doing is defaulting people into the better teacher's plan. Mm -hmm. And then the, the faculty member has the choice of saying, I don't want that plan. I would rather be in Social Security or I'd rather be in cash balance or I'd rather be in net life insurance. So, to so get, you would have to make that choice. So mm -hmm. then you want cash balance and social security because on cash balance, you have no disability insurance, but on social security, you do? Cash balance is nothing more than um, like an IRA. You get right. nothing. Right, so you do want the, but you want to be have a, so you, what, then you go into 413B and social security? Is that how you do it? No, it, it would be a choice. I mean, what we're talking about is if you're being hired, you would be defaulted into STRS DB. Yeah. If you don't want to be in STRS DB, you have to tell the district, I don't want to be in this. And then they'll say, here are your other choices. We want Social Security to be one of those choices. Right now, it isn't in every district. And neither is cash balance in every district. To, to pull this back into what can we do, Deb, is there any way that uh, Sadafa and our other groups like CBFA could support this campaign? This I would say once we get the campaign some, somewhat um, organized, um, this is something FAC is going to be tackling in the spring, and right. they're going to be going to COFO, and they'll be talking to CTA, and they'll be talking to um, CFT and they'll be talking to triple CI and they'll be talking to all the various players to say, this is something we want to work on. We need everyone on board with it. So yeah, at some point we'll be needing the support of all the other big players mm -hmm. in the state to be able to go to the legislature when we have a piece of legislation. Deborah, right. do you know, uh, do you know the position of the chancellor's office and the, the community college league on this? Have, has there oh, I'm sure they'll be against it. And the reason they will be against it is there's a huge cost to them. Stop that. Sorry. My dog is chewing up my slipper. <laughs> um, yeah. The reason the league will be against it is they'll, they'll be looking at the bottom line cost and they're gonna say, oh, but STRS DB is so expensive for our districts to pay. And our point is, so every part-timer has the right to sign up for STRS DB if they wanted to. So what if we got did a campaign and had everybody sign up for it? You'd still be stuck with the cost. They'll what argue something like that it's better for adjunct faculty to have the free choice to be able to have that cash immediately. Yes, Something and like we're going to, and we're saying that they do have that choice. We are going to say they're defaulting into this, but they have a choice to sign for up for something other if that's not appropriate no. for them. No. So if they're, you know, if they're a full time person at Hewlett Packard and they're saying, I don't want to be in DB, just give me the cash balance savings account, fine, they can sign up for it. We're not telling them they can't. Yeah. Well, that's especially true for someone who has a, a full time job outside of teaching who teaches one class. Uh, they're not going to be teach enough classes in their life to no, best. do that. Right. And that's the point. Yeah. 
but so many part-timers have right. been hurt by being defaulted into cash balance right. or into pear or apple or one of those other plans that we're saying, look at the majority of part-timers, majority tend right. to be career oriented. Right. Either they're looking for a full-time job down the road or they're gonna be part-time for many years, like 20 or 30 years while they do other mm -hmm. stuff too. Deborah, could you briefly give the, uh, the the short history of what happened in the 90s, late 90s, when we changed to um, a year's credit for STIRS, the part-time situation? What happened in the mid-90s yeah. was we had a lot of part-timers who were complaining, well, back in the 80s and early 90s, they were complaining they weren't vesting. And it took them, instead of, let's say, four years to vest or five years to vest, it was taking them like 10 or more years to vest. And that's because STRS, the, the system of STRS was built on the K-12 model of 1,050 hours of student contact time like you would if you were in elementary school. And the part-timers were going to say, well, this is absurd because colleges don't work that way. We don't work those kind of hours. That's not how it's, that's not how it's uh, built. And so they came up with this plan in the mid nineties to change the full-time equivalent annual hours from 1050 to 525. And so that changed how the reporting was done and suddenly people were now getting the type of service credit. Well, if the districts did it correctly that they would get the uh, correct service credit for what they were actually doing, meaning people could now vest. The problem was that one, not all the districts cooperated with the change in law. And then two, there was a problem when they went to do the final computation for retirement because it changed people's earnable earnings basis. And then suddenly people weren't getting the pension they deserved. And hence we came up with AB 1586. And just so you know, even though AB 1586 was passed in the early 2000s, it was fully retroactive to anyone who had retired during those years. And people literally saw their retirements sometimes double. If I can jump in here just a moment, I'm one of those people, because I hired in in 82, not that my pension doubled, but when I went to retire in um, a couple of years ago, they knew I was one of those people. And they take it into consideration when they calculate what your pension's going to be. So you don't have to identify yourself, but it doesn't hurt to remind them. Yeah, everybody, they do have everybody flagged in their system. They know exactly who to look for. Okay, um, we're gonna open the breakout rooms now. And we really only had one breakout room, which is the same thing we've been talking about all the time. So we'll just continue it there. The only real difference is we're gonna stop the recording so you'll have, uh, um, you know, uh, confidence in bringing up whatever confidential or personal information you have about your uh, issues and be able to ask questions uh, from, from Deborah and others. So I'm going to start the room now. Just join the breakout room. Go in there. If you want to talk about other issues besides uh, retirement and then all of this, um, just stay in the room here and we'll have a few people here. Uh, left over to talk about any any other issues you have. I'm going to turn the recording off and we'll we'll uh, open all these rooms. Uh, David's going to close this out really quick, but just right. join your breakout room and you can leave the breakout room and come back to this main room too if you want to talk about something else besides that's not retirement stirs. Web. Right. Okay. Arnie, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I think it's been very informative, lots of great questions, continuing conversations that we will have. And do consider, I have, as the chair, I have to plug Sadafa. Please join Sadafa so you can support us in our efforts to help you. Okay? And uh, have fun in the breakouts and stay here if you'd like to talk about legislation. Thank you so much. Bye bye.